dear colleagues, uh, let us begin our scientific event. It's a great pleasure for us to have uh, the International Erasmus Staff Mobility Week in Shvili University, Lithuania. And the Researchers Excellence Network is congratulating all participants of this scientific public lecture, uh, which is held in Lithuania, Shvili University. We have some participants here uh, our students and lecturers and colleagues here uh, in the room, as well as we have some participants online, because this event is uh, broadcasting the internet as well. So uh, let us uh, begin our public lecture. And it's a great pleasure to introduce you our speaker for today's uh, event. It's Associated Professor Dandi Bastola and he comes from the University of Nebraska at Omaha in the USA. And uh, uh, today we will have two moderators. Uh, I am lecturer of Dr. Yukhnevichine, and I present the Researchers Excellence Network. And we have uh, our colleague, well-known associated professor, Egidius Palulis from Shule University. He and me will try to moderate this discussion. Uh, I would like to remind you things that, first of all, we will have a presentation. Please prepare some questions for our presenter. Everybody who, has, uh, who are connected via internet have the possibility to give some questions for our presenter as well. Please make it in the chat line. As well, we will wait some questions from the audience to the presenter. And uh, after presentation, we will have a time for discussion. So please be very active and ask what is interesting for you. So I would like to uh, ask my colleague, uh, Associated Professor Egidius, to introduce our key speaker for today, and maybe in more details. So thank you. Okay, uh, it's very nice. Uh, and I'm very glad that we have a special guest today from the United States. Nebraska University. My first meeting with Professor Chandi was in 2013. I have an internship with the University of Nebraska. And together we worked in project biomedical support system. Uh, yes, I, I can say that uh, Professor Chandi is one of the best bioinformatics researcher in Nebraska University. So I was appreciate to have such a colleague. Uh, and now, Day, Dr. Stola then interesting presentation. This is already title on the screen. Uh, so Dr. Bostola have a lot of uh, high review peer uh, review publications, a lot of conferences. He, he's very active in research activities. Uh, university, Nebraska University, where we have projects research. Such research field. Okay, now yes, I would like to give audience. We will look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, um, our ICTS and uh, and the organizer here. It's it's definitely a great pleasure. It's a different different environment, especially to share the kind of work that you're doing. So today, what I'm going to do is, um, as you can see, uh, the title of the Interface of Life Science Computing. This is something new. So before I even get started, maybe I'll check with you how many of you are more from the computer science. Okay. And rest of you are from the biology or something. So that, that's great. So what I'm, I am a biologist by training. Okay, but then it's been about 10 years now that you know I am in this domain. What I'm going to do today is to basically share with you what where I come from, the university. I'll talk to you about the university and then about our college, the different programs and activities that we are engaged in in the, the 
College. And finally, I'll talk to you about uh, the biomedical research thematics um, research that is ongoing in, in our department. This is a picture of our university. As you know, you've seen that in my first slide. Um, Nebraska is in the middle of the United States. Okay, this area you can see right? So that area, this whole area is therefore called heartland. Okay. And we are very close to the reference point most of the international students like to is we are very closer to Chicago. It's about twelve hour drive, one hour flight to Chicago and Colorado is another nearest town that this is a picture of our university. Um, as you can see here, this is the main campus. Most of you, uh, the earlier participants in the RENET came from CPACs, you know, from administration, um, public administration. But our campus is across that um, golf course over there in the corner that you can see on the right. And, uh, Go to we call it a South Campus, or now it is renamed as Scott Campus. That's that's our building. That building is basically divided into two sections. The one on the left side is the engineering building, uh, the engineering school, and on the right side is information science and technology. That is where we are. Um, the structure of our our college College of Information Science and Technology. We've got three departments. One is um, Department of Computer Science, and another is Management Information System. These are the two um, major departments before I joined, joined the program about 2007. At that time, I was hired in, in the computer science department, but our, because of our dean's initiative, he started this new, new school called School of Interdisciplinary Informatics, and we from the biomedical uh, informatics, we moved to the uh, School of Interdisciplinary Informatics, and as you can see there, bioinformatics, information insurance, and uh, IT innovation. These are the three major, I uh, wouldn't say subunit, but you know, disciplines inside of School of Interdisciplinary Informatics. In terms of um, population, you know, students, we have got about 1,380 in the college. This is the census from 2016 last fall. And uh, we've got a graduate program, uh, master's degree, there are 400 people there right now. And um, a PhD program, we've got 23 students. And then an undergraduate program, we've got 971 students. As you can see, those numbers are divided into the two major ones, like what I said earlier, the major department is still computer science and the management information systems, but the school is picked up. Okay, in the in the school, you, as you can see, we've got one undergraduate students majoring in bioinformatics, and then the graduate program we just started three years ago in biomedical informatics and information assurance and IT innovation. As you can see, the numbers there are lots of computer science students who are majoring in uh, computer science with their bachelors. Now they are taking uh, information assurance for, for obvious reasons, for those of you who are from computer science. Um, but our program is a little different. See, in our, um, in our bioinformatics program, as you can imagine, bioinformatics uh, uses skills from computer science, the, the life science and mathematics and uh, computing, okay? It's basically um, quantitative skills. And uh, what we try to do is we try to merge them. So we have several, several um, programs that the school or the college has started that allows students to move around. Like for example, here that might be of interest you or this group is plus two option for international partners. We do have partnership uh, with, um, I believe uh, Chalet is the sister university uh, with, with our, 
so what that means is I think there is some understanding with the tuition, okay, and uh, for for exchange, and we also have um, relationship with with India and um, Germany, and I believe Austria. There are many exchange program that is going on between you know, um, different different countries. But the one that I think um, I highlighted there, the plus two option is definitely something I think is very relevant to, to this situation. Now the highlight of this plus two option is this, is that you as a student would complete three years of your bachelor's here. And on your fourth year, you join the master's program in our college, okay? And after you complete that first year in, in, at, the, at UNO, then you have to come and complete your degree here. You will get a bachelor's degree from your home institute before you can start your second year of your master's. And then you complete it you know, in your second year. So essentially what is happening is that you, you have, you complete three years of your bachelor's degree in your home institute. You go to the United States and do two years of master's. And so within five years, you have a master's degree. You have a master's degree from the United States and you have a bachelor's degree from your home institute. That is the understanding that we have. Basically all of those highlighted red is, that is what you guys have any question for me at this time? All right. So, um, so among the graduate programs, of course, we do have for the uh, you know computer science and, and uh, management information system. But for school, also we do have masters in information insurance and the masters in biomedical informatics. And very soon, hopefully, starting next fall, we're going to have a masters in um, IT innovation as well. So these are the three. Uh, discipline three programs inside of the school. All of them are going to have. Um, However, the PhD program, we've got two PhDs. One is with the PhD in information technology. So anybody graduating with a computer science management information system or IT innovation or um, information insurance, they're going to go into the PhD in IT program. Whereas there is another program, you know, the graduate program that we have we've started is biomedical informatics. This is a joint program between us, UNO, and a medical school. So there is a medical school about two miles from our location and is still within the same umbrella of the University of Nebraska system. So this is a joint program that we have. The students can come through the medical school, get the PhD degree, or they can go through UNO and get, get um, Now, faculty research interests, these are the, you know, there's a whole list. If you are interested, you can always, you know, I can share this slide with you. Uh, more importantly, the one that I have highlighted here is dark, are the ones faculty specialization with background in biomedical information. They are currently engaged in biomedical research. At the and that basically includes, you know, uh, Big data analytics, and I'll, I will talk more about that, you know, when um, in in the next couple of weeks. Now, in addition to these major programs, the college is also engaged in community engagement as well. I mean, UNO is very much known for a metropolitan university, just like what you guys have here. Now, we are in the middle of in, in the central town, okay. And what we do is most of our student population, those of us particularly who are in their graduate program, they have a job. They have a full-time job. And then once they're out of job, you know, once they're done you know, with their work for the day, in the evening, we have many, many graduate programs that goes on. Start at five, you know, and then close on. Or okay. So we, that is how we encourage students who completed their bachelor's degree, then they have a they have a job, and then they can continue pursuing their graduate, you know, um, graduate program. 
And uh, another thing good about Omaha community is that you know, the company, they encourage. I know several years ago, uh, they used to fund them. Also, they used to pay their tuition. I still, there, I think there are still some program who, who does that, okay? But it's not as common as it used to be. Obviously, everything is tied all over the world. <laughs> relationship between the between the university and and the community you know um, for for student internship and, and different time. there is one of the different activities you know besides the major you know the degree program that we have, have this, this is woman in IT initiative it's based Particularly to encourage women into going into the IT domain. As you know, that if you go and look into the statistics, you will see that many female students they prefer not to, you know, go into IT okay, unless you know they are determined or they have the influence, and they are trying to. overcome those, remove those limitations that exist for a female student to, to go into the IT. And it, it's really, really successful. Word Crush is another one where, where again, the um, especially to educate teachers. Here, what they do is they actually get one student and a and a teacher here from different uh, parts of Nebraska, and then they house them in the city for a week, and then we give them all kinds of exposure to what IT is or what bioinformatics is, and also to the teachers as to how they can present their material in school, just so that they can encourage um, students to come and pursue their IT career. But although the, of course, the goal is because we we're doing it, so we want them to come to IT. But there has been very many successful cases where they may not choose to come to IT, but they will choose some other STEM, okay. and that is okay too. The goal is to get them into IT. I think the program has been very very successful in that, in that regard. Another thing that we've been doing, um, I remember that, and I think this is another one of uh, our dean's initiative where he's basically encouraging um, students to come in, into the IT program. And so those high school students who are interested, what we do is, um, we just finished last week um, uh, this, this batch. So they will come and participate with us for eight weeks. They will stay in Omaha area, and then um, it, just like any other internship, will expose them for these different programs, you know, the programs of robotics, bioinformatics, software engineering, public health, these different areas, students will get an exposure, actually do some research. And then at the end of eight weeks, they, they will have to present So this has been a really, really successful program, which is which may not be considered mainstream academic, but I think it is definitely a very, um, um, very good program. Another program that, um, that we have started. This is not just focused on IT, but in you know uh, STEM area, all science and technology overall. And uh, a lot of my students who are, you know, some of them who are undergraduate students, others who are graduate students, they actually go to school and teach them about bioinformatics. This is an after school program. So they are doing lots of activities, again, in different areas. And this is becoming successful as well. So this year, Actually, we didn't have um, the, the the state is going under budget price like any any other, and um, so the we didn't have funding. But then the community actually um, raised some money to continue that. So it, it has been so success successful that even in the absence of our own money, you know, just so that um, the the program continues. 
I think the university has. In addition to all those, those are the uh, those are the programs that are initiated by by the. Okay. But as you know, that um, during summer, um, that there are lots of students who have enough time. Right? Kids don't go to; they don't have their school. Right. So in order to engage them, what we do is we we do have. Uh, this is they pay for. They just like you know going to a daycare, uh, but then we have a morning session or the afternoon session, and uh, they will pay for this. And um, bioinformatics, one of those programs we've been doing for about ten years at the university, and uh, this is ongoing. Now, what is the idea behind this? Is is that for young kids, to expose them to this discipline? You know, in their early age, before they even reach high school, just so that they have an uh, idea as to if this is, you know, they'll try out, they'll try one week of bioinformatics, another week of IT innovation, another week of robotics, and so on and so forth. This just to get an idea as to where their heart, is, just so that they can pursue that dream job. Okay, so this is this is all about the um, about you know, the university, about the, the, the college, and the different programs the college has. Okay. Now, I think I'm going to take another hour focusing more on the research activities related to um, bioinformatics. Now, can I take a quick um, uh, survey here? Anybody know what bioinformatics is? I'm not, I'm not trying to put you guys on spot, but it's okay. It's okay not to know. No, okay. I'm not expecting that everybody knows what bioinformatics is because, and that's the reason, you know, why I'm here. And that's the reason, you know, I like to explain that because this is new. And, you know, um, don't feel bad if you don't know. It's exactly what I'm going to do. I just want to get a feel for where, how deep I should go um, and so that, um, let me, can I presume that none of you know what bioinformatics is at the time? Yes? All right. That's good, good enough. Okay. So historically, you know, um, we, we've come a long way. We've come a long ways in terms of what healthcare, what kind of medicine that we have. When you go to the doctor, you know, the kind of treatment that you have. Let's go back to the history. What happened, you know, 18th and 19th century was that, you know, we were living in the jungle, right? We didn't have a social group. We gradually started building, you know, a social network, you know, by the river, most probably, right? Most of the civilization, it all started by the river, right? right? And then, because of that, because we are social animal, whether we like it or not, okay, what happened is that we have problems, right? One of the major problems of this socialization, okay, living together, is that you have infectious disease. This is still a problem in many, you know, non-industrialized Okay, we have cholera, we have tuberculosis, we have measles, pneumonia, you name it. There's a whole list of those infectious diseases. What we have, although this has been a creation of bonding or socializing, we have made some progress. We are human after all, right? We have made some progress, and the kind of progress I have listed here is, you know, one of the, the earliest one was about vaccine. Those of you in, the, you know, who have taken biology might know that, you know, people who were exposed, to, especially maids at that time, milkmaids, you know, who were exposed to cows, they, they were literally vaccinated to chicken farm. Okay, they would not have chickenpox. And what they found out was it was because they were exposed to the cowpox, whose, you know, the virus is very similar to that of, of chickenpox. So because they were exposed to cowpox, they were immune to Okay, so that is where the concept of vaccination came, came about, right? And now we've got a whole list of, of vaccines um, that we have, that we have today, right? I'm sure 
it's true here as well. Without your vaccination card, you're not allowed to go into school. Okay, and that is true in the United States. You've got to provide each year, you know, especially in the elementary and even in high school, we do have to have that vaccination record. And the reason for that is that if you are not vaccinated, then suddenly you become the host for the virus you know, that you created so spread into the population at the right? Now, in addition to development in that area of immunization and vaccination, what have we accomplished in the 20th, 20th century? I'm sure you'll agree with me, right? We have been, you know, the heart transplant is very common these days, right? And the reason for that is we have the, the lung machine, heart lung machine, so that you can bypass your, your system into that machine, okay? During the time the, the, the surgeon can go and take care of your heart, right? That's an example over there. It's not a really good looking picture, but that's what I found out in the internet. Obviously, I don't have access to the, to, to the operation theater. But the point is that technology has enabled us to do this, right? And in medicine, as I said before, um, there was vaccine, more of the vaccine on polio, measles, mumps, rubella, and this and this. The list is longer now, but the major accomplishment of that time was antibiotics. Okay, antibiotics, particularly penicillin. I'm sure you know the story about how penicillin was developed, right? Yes. No. Okay. So this was this was the penicillin was a story about a researcher. He was trying to he or she I don't recall was trying to go on a vacation. Okay, they left the petri dish with agar. Okay in the sink. After the researcher came back from, from his or her vacation, they found out that the bacteria around that area, you know, that yellow or the blue fungus that you see in, um, in your, um, to leave your bread in a moist condition, you see that blue fungus, right? Similarly, in, in that plate, found out that, you know, the area around that was this, there was no bacteria, okay? And that is what led to the discovery of penicillin. Basically, that fungus was generating the, the medicine, penicillin, okay? And that was killing the bacteria. Discovered, and now you've got all kinds of antibiotics to take care of infection, right? Believe it or not, this was infection. There are a lot of people who died during the World War you know, One and Two, okay, because they were on roads when they went into in, in, you know, when they were fighting, they didn't die because of a gunshot. They died because of infection. Can you believe that? Okay, this happened. This happened, you know, in our parents or grandparents' generation. That is what we have accomplished in the twentieth century. Okay, and the, the list goes on, and the list goes on. Now, what is the accomplishment of 21st century? That, that is. Anybody read what that is? It's a bunch of four letters. Okay? It's A, T, G, and C. These are the, the, the alphabet that represents amino acid. Okay? That makes up our DNA. Once we have that genomic information, now we have, you know, the human genome was a big accomplishment. That's basically what it is, ATGNC. We've got it for humans, and I will show you we've got it for many, many other things, okay? If you were to take the human genome and print it, you know how fine those um, letters are in a phone book, right? It's hardly, you can barely see it, I mean, especially with with our age, you definitely need a magnifying glass to see anything there, okay? And that is the story. It'll, there are three billion bases in every genome that we have. And uh, it would take 200 volumes of telephone books, like so, like the one that I've shown you there, 
And with 1,000 pages, you should be able to compile the human genome. That is so much of that in one cell inside us. Okay? That's so much information. Okay? That is what we've been able to you get from, from the Human Genome Project. Now, yes, Human Genome Project was expensive. It cost $3 billion and several years. Okay? But it was done before time. Okay? And under, you know, they were, you know, they didn't spend all the money either, okay? But the good thing for us is there was, a, you know, this new discipline in bioinformatics was born, okay? It has led to data now from all over the world. It's not just centered in five places when it, when it began, okay? But now we've got that kind of information, not only for humans, but for a lot of other living organisms, okay? And the reason for that is that um, <clears throat> the all living organisms. I'll come back to that. You know, maybe in a one first of this two, two more slides later as to why it is so significant. Okay, but in addition to those um, these data, the nucleotide sequence I call it nucleotide sequence data. It's present all over the world. We have started accumulating data like this, nucleic acid, more and more of this. And um, I have compiled this. I do that every year. This is the old slide that was compiled on, on until 2012. But the, you can see that the trend is going. You know, the, the one in this, this one here in the middle, that is for nucleotide. Okay? That is for nucleotide. And you can see that that's an exponential growth. It's mainly because there is more of genome sequence now you know, that we are capturing. In addition to that genome sequence, now we've got other data as well. We've got um, protein data. We've got different properties. You know, we see that. And nucleic acid research, this is one of the journals that we have. It's a prestigious journal. They basically dedicate one issue just for databases. Databases are those where you store all the knowledge that we have gained over the years on that subject matter, right? And this is the trend. This is the trend of that kind of data relating to a biological system, not just human. All kinds of biological systems. It could be plant, it could be bacteria, it could be viruses, okay? Virus, although it's qualified myself, it's not living, right? So we've got this data. And it's because of this reason. See, I was very excited when, when I said that we had a, the information from the human genome. The reason for that is, see that DNA over there? Okay. The DNA, the reason why I was excited was that it stores information about a living system. Meaning that it's like a, it's like a book. You read this book and you know what this book is. Okay. It's like your hard drive in a computer, okay? You have access to all kinds of software in there, and your computer suddenly can do a lot of stuff, right? In other words, what I'm saying is that every cell that, you know, the, the DNA that we, your parents gave us, right? Our parents gave us, they gave us this. Half of them came from father, half of that DNA came from mother. Right? And the reason it is important is that you can have function, meaning I'm moving my arm, I'm walking around, all this capability that I have, okay, is embedded. That information is embedded. In that. Okay? So as a, as a student, as an academic, you know, people engage in academic activity, why is it so exciting? The excitement is here. Every domain that we have going into function, okay, we've got data. We've got sequence data relating to um, DNA. We've got genome sequences, like I showed you earlier, for human genome including. We've got RNA sequence, which is an intermediate to the protein, which is proteins are the working horse. Anything that you do in your body, proteins are responsible, right? 
to produce that protein, we need information from RNA. In order to produce that RNA, we need that information embedded in DNA as well, right? So ultimately, no matter what you do in that function, okay, your information is contained, it is embedded. So anything goes wrong in that DNA, your function is compromised. Meaning, somebody has breast cancer, others have this cancer or that cancer. We associated that with, you know, breast cancer is the well-known one, BRCA gene, right? That is, there is mutation in DNA that leads to a function which is not accepted. That leads to a disease condition. Okay, that is why, because now we have data from all this, these stages, okay, we have better understanding about what a normal functioning body should be. Okay, because of that knowledge now, we are in a position to do things that we were not able to do before. Okay? What we used to do is this. Okay? If that was an elephant, people would go, you know, just like my cartoon there, okay? One would say that, you know, that's a tree. Another would say that that is a snake, and so on and so forth, right? Why is that? It's because of limited vision. You know, if I was blind, I did not see this. I, of course, when I touch this, I'm going to say that it all feels like a tree. Okay? That is exactly as a scientist, as a researcher in life sciences, that is what we used to do. We had, we had control. You know, from my PhD, what I did was... I generated a cell line. where there was a mouse gene. Of course, I was not trying to make monster out of it. I was trying to answer a specific question because in my lab, my, my advisor and the group had this hypothesis saying that if you overexpress this particular gene, then you're going to have this concept, meaning there is going to be more somatic embryos. That's, that's what, it was a developmental question that we're trying to address. That's all I knew. So I was that's an L. Going back to my, you know, the, the, the timeline story, okay, from 18th to 19th to 21st century, this is the kind of life science work. This is the kind of biology, it, you know, almost 15 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, you're not looking into one gene and trying to see and understand what it does, okay? You as a student of today, you'll be dealing with this. Take the What is interesting to you? So before you even design and do any experiment, okay, you have to go and analyze that data and then come up with a hypothesis and say, okay, Given all that, that knowledge is about DNA, RNA, protein, and everything, okay, here is a hypothesis, here is a research question I have. You have to do it. You don't have a choice. You cannot say that, oh, I'm not good in mathematics, or I'm not good in biology, or, sorry, I'm not good in computers, so I'm, not, I'm going to go for biology. It's not an option anymore. Okay? You have to do that because the 21st century biology is taught in this manner. Okay, you got to begin with the data before you do any, uh, you can ask any specific question. Okay? Why? Here is an answer. Why? Is because if 
this was, you know, if I were to capture this more like a, you know, a disease process, okay? So here's a disease, okay? It takes a process, right? It takes a process, and then T1, T2, T3, T4 are the different time points you could be diagnosed with that disease. Long time ago, 20, 25 years ago, when we were still, you know, doing limited stuff, we would be capturing, we would be diagnosing a disease at T4 state. Okay, so the between the time between T4 diagnosis and death was very short. Right? Now with this knowledge that we have gained, you know, with, with the sequencing technology and all the biomedical data that I talk about, what we are trying to do is we are trying to push that time. We're, pu we're trying to push that time in that direction, meaning that let's diagnose a disease early on in the process so that we'll have a better, we'll live longer, and we'll have a quality of life during that. That's the idea, right? So all this that I'm talking about, the ultimate goal is that we want to have a quality of life and a longer one, okay? That's the goal. And who is providing that, the data that you provide. And here is a proof. Here is a proof. When I came to uh, Lithuania, when I was planning the trip here, okay, either if I did not have the weather per forecasting, I, I, I would have called Igdias and say, hey, Igdias, what's the weather like and how should I pack? Right? But now I went there. And then I checked, you know, this whole week was gloomy and wintry, and so I had to get my warm coat, okay? And I, I had a, um, you know, the uh, umbrella. I packed those. It is convenient. Yeah, that's no big deal, okay? I could get wet for a day or, you know, it's no big deal. But my, my point is that with the, with the data that we have collected over the years regarding the wind, the pattern, we can, we can predict, we can predict what it's going to be like for weeks ahead of what it actually happens, right? So what we're trying to do with, with this biological data, okay, we've got data at all points that decides what function is. Should we be able to do this? That's exactly what this domain, this biomedical informatics, the intention of that, is let's capture this data, just like, the, like what the weatherman has been doing all this time, and come up with a prediction. Just like they're doing the prediction, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make it precision, meaning that in, you know, before, before this model um, came to be, which we have access to today, even if it's, it, it is still not implemented um, properly, okay? What we're trying, each individual is different, right? Our treatment, you know, what the medical doctors would do is they would use statistics. Say, for example, I have a pill, and if this is to treat, you know, people infected with TB, yeah, I will take 100, there are clinical trials. We'll have clinical trials, right? We'll use that medicine, and if it works for 95% of that population, that's a go. We give that. What happens if you are one of those five who did not, you know, this medicine did not work? Right? Did the doctor will just say, I'm sorry. But for you, it's not acceptable, right? That's what we want to. Now, imagine that if you're giving this number 100, you know, five is an exception, right? Put that into the real, real number. How many? What is the population in the world? Okay, and that five percent is huge too, right? So what we're trying to do with this approach now is, can we, can we tailor the medicine, diagnosis, or whatever it is to that individual? Okay. That is where the direction is, okay? and and as you can imagine, that is where we are. Okay, here is here is my team, 
uh, for our group at UNO. Um, I will show this is Kate. Um, is was one of our undergraduate students. She finished her undergraduate degree with us. She finished her PhD, and she's a faculty professor today. Um, Dario Garcia, he is a MD, MD PhD. He finished his medical degree. And he got his PhD, and he's a faculty today. And that's um, Dr. Ali. He is the dean of the college. Okay, and also he is the one who started the the, the bioinformatics program in. And in the corner there is Sanjukta Bhaumik. She is the one who uh, deals with parallel computing. And of course, and the rest of them are students. You know, this was just Jeet. She graduated. I'll, I'll be talking about her work today. Scott is still a PhD student. Um, John is a PhD student. And the rest of them are master's. So among the researchers you know i've listed four of us dr ali as i said you know is the dean and dario with the medical degree his interest is more on computation immunology i'll give you um, a little more about that uh, regarding kate as well as um dario's project kate is like i said she has a, a phd in bioinformatics and then her interest is more on big data and uh mine i have a phd in and biology, and my interest all over the place. I will, I'll talk to you more about it. So this is Dario's project, as he has his philosophy. As you can see there, he's interested in finding a bridge between the, the large-scale omics data set that we talk about. So all this, you know, the, the discipline, people trying to study the genome, is called genomics, right? Transcript the, the transcript they're, they're studying, transcriptome, proteome, protein, proteome. So there are lots of omics. You know, it basically refers to all those data sets of that intermediate um, information processing that I showed you. And uh, two major um, areas that he's focusing on is studying the impact of cancer mutation on protein function and also on uh, the molecular mechanism of immune response using computational approach. So these are the two major research areas Dario is involved in. Kate, as you can see, she's using networks to, uh, graph networks, to understand big data. Mainly, um, she has publications, as I will show, share with you very shortly, in these different domains. Basically, she's taking, um, these are all his publications in all those categories. Okay, it's basically they're taking data and then processing it with specific questions in that domain. So as you can see that, although her training is in bioinformatics, she's able to do data and analysis in general in so many different domains. Okay, so just because you have a bioinformatics degree doesn't mean that you've got to be doing or you should be doing just that because these are all part of medicine too. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ali's work that uh, one of the things that I was part of a long time ago, a, a, a quick example of what kind of, you know, you may not even imagine, or those of you who are with a biology degree might understand this, okay, is we're looking into a mouse in a case, okay, and uh, what Kate did during her PhD work, she basically went and uh, isolated the RNA data for these mice. And we were trying to associate why young mice differs with the old mice. Okay. Now what is the difference? Of course, one is older than you know age wise, but you could even look in the data and find out this one is old and that one is young. You, you see here the, the 15 month old and the two month old, you look into the speed. Of course they are younger, they are faster. Right? The younger they are faster. But the interesting data is on the right side. See, the data there is the 15 month and the two month. Okay, you notice that the the 15 month ones, okay, they they they, they move less, but they work further. Okay, 
Anytime they, they come out of their hiding, they make sure they get their job done before they go, go inside, okay? Now, think of this from pre predatory point of view. Mouse are, you know, they need to eat, right? And they need to do that during the day. Now, if there are other predators outside, when you come out of the hiding, you better make sure that get your job done. Then you don't want to come out more frequently, okay? So, trust me, older people are wiser, <laughs> right? This is what is happening. This is basically explaining, right, that older mice, you know, they, they are, they plan their travel. They plan it, get their job done. And all these differences, Kate was able to analyze the transcriptome data and then show a difference why is appropriate, okay? And here are my research areas of interest. Um, my research areas of interest, as I will go very fast. I've got lots of slides. Major, major areas are regulation of gene expression because I come from biology domain. That's, that's what I got started with. And I'm gradually moving more into preventative medicine, okay? And I will, I will talk more about that. So the, one of the PhDs, you know, my just you know, PhD student, what she did was we worked on microRNAs. I'm sure you guys know what microRNA is. Okay, we've got several publications on that. Basically, in in this case, what we are trying to do is, once we have the microRNA identified, we we basically came up with a method to identify the target for microRNAs. Okay, and microRNA basically goes goes to the three prime end of the of the messes, okay, and it binds, makes a double strand like I've showed you in that corner over there, and then when it becomes a double stranded RNA, then then there is a missionary that comes and kills that. So there is no protein in it. Okay. So that was one that is the first process that she did. And then we we micro a bunch of RNAs that is controlled by micro They wouldn't be called modules. And then we're using this to identify if there is a way to use this technology in to control or uh, substitute um, pancreatic cancer. Okay, so the way that we did is, you know, this this is this is the idea behind it. In, in conventional therapeutics, this is what we do. We have DNA, RNA, you know, that information processing that I talk about, right? Protein is the functional unit. If that red one hit there is necessary to do the function, okay, it will proliferate. So if this is what was causing cancer, if that red thing was responsible for, or that that uh, that protein yellow was responsible for for that proliferation of that cell, then then the approach, the drug approach, would be okay. Replace that catalytic domain or whatever, okay, and not make that protein work so that the proliferation, okay. Now, it is we are we are using that treatment at that end because now we have information upstream. My idea was why don't we take advantage of RNA and still get the same job done? Okay, and I will explain to you a little more about how uh, we, we we leverage this. We take that RNA and then. If we control that RNA, there is no protein. If we don't have that protein, then there is no function, right? So we went basically up, all right? And so in her work, we basically went and looked into the different ways of predict that RNA. And then um, here is an example. Why do we care? Okay? Imagine that, you know, we are, we are interested in controlling proliferation and cell migration. These are the hallmarks. You know, these are the major activities that is happening in a cancer cell, right? Essential cell functions. We need to save that. When you when you control that protein, then it messes up everything. Okay, good as well as bad. Okay, we are interested in saving the good and you know getting rid of the bad ones, right? So here is the examples. If say for example, those are the microRNAs, those that can inhibit these function. What would be the good good ones? They all target. So three of them are candidate ones, right? They can, as you can see, these, these,
of the pointer. All right. So all of them are function. They can they can get rid of of this protein, right? But the point is that which one is better? I'll give you a minute, or maybe a second. <laughs> so you will see that. These guys are better because it can control proliferation and it can get rid of the cell migration. Okay? But this one is not because, in addition to getting rid of this, it also affects one of the things that is essential. Okay? So, this is definitely not a good part. However, a good candidate. In the same vein, see, although this guy, can affect both groups, it also affects the good one. Okay? So it turns out that this is the only one that is good because it does not affect the good one and it controls all the. Those are the kind of stuff that you want to identify and use that to use it as a drug, as, as a therapy. And that's basically what we did in the case of pancreatic cancer. We went and looked into what are the different pathways those are involved, are known for pancreatic cancer. We went and found out what the enzymes are for them. So what could be those target genes? And then we ranked them and gave it to, you know, and um, came up with, with a method to, uh, for an outcome to show that, you know, these are the set of microRNA. If you are interested in targeting these enzymes in this pathway, this is how you know this would be the list of microRNA. Okay, so we, um, as I told you, we published. This is another PhD student who was doing more on the pattern recognition. You know, different kinds of signals. He's published several of those. We basically looked into one of the one of the examples that I, I want to talk to you about here is you know that if you go and look into that DNA, we went we are, we were interested more in how a mitochondria functions. Mitochondria is one of the energy producing organelles in our cell, right? And because it is in a hot zone, right, Me meaning that it is always bombarded, it's like a, going into a nuclear reactor, right? So we said that, is there any protective mechanism for the proteins who actually function? And so what we did was we went and looked into the function of those and we found out that, you know, yes, indeed, there are, you know, those, those amino acids, they are not, um, they are not affected by this high level of um, uh, free radicals that is present in, in a mitochondria. And now I'm gradually moving more into diagnostics and more chemistry related stuff. And this was one of the master's students project. What she, her major question was to find out, does the efficacy of multiple anti-cancer therapies depend on post immune response? So what we did, we went and looked into TCGA data TCGA is the you know the databases where they give you all the you know the cancer patient they go and look into the SMT meaning this is one of the markers biomarkers they go and look into how often or what are the kind of mutation that has happened okay we go and analyze that and we and in addition to those SNP data what they also have is these are the different drugs that is being used for the treatment and we go and correlate this SNP data with the kind of survival that they get. Meaning, if you have a complete remission of that disease, of that cancer, you go and associate that with what kind of mutation was, you know, responsible. Um, and we we have the um, and this is uh, what we have done now is, now I'm moving more into the chemistry and drugs. What we did was we went and looked into all the natural products. You know, plants, we know that, right? Even I think I'm sure the Lithuania is no exception. This is in every country. You know, there is home remedy. Instead of going to the doctor, your mother or your father might say that, okay, eat this or drink that if you have a cold, if you have a stomach ache or this or that, right? Why are they doing that? And the reason for that is there is time tested, okay? There is some chemical present in those foods, okay? 
whether it is your basil that you eat or you know the uh, cilantro or what have you they have chemicals so what we did was we went and looked into all the natural products that are out there and we extracted if there is a drug related part in there okay to show a relation why that is significant so that's that's the project that we completed just yesterday was it yesterday or day before my students submitted this this is another one what we have done is we have um we have looked into oops. what we have done is we have we have taken 24 herbs you know cilantro basil gel and so forth we've gone and extracted all the known um, chemicals which has biological activity and then track their enzymatic pathway and we've created a graph database and this this is not even public we just submitted it yesterday or you know after I said okay so these are the different kinds of work that is going on and this uh, yesterday over dinner is this is a food computer okay those of you who are interested in the we have some technological interest but at the same time we want to apply that into perfect um, then there is a really the, the Arduino controls all inside the, for the light intensity your um the temperature of water temperature of um, and, and uh um, and, and, uh, um, and yes and the, the ph so, so total of seven seven sensors is being constantly monitored by the program that we put into that it will turn on the heater so this this box here there is a heater inside there so it basically what it does is it provides all the time for the plan that i plan for okay so why why do i care about that okay so just um in a, during spring break we are interested in taking that into school systems okay we built eight of those i already have four that is working and we built another eight i think i've finished four of them before it's still halfway done it's half cooked and i will talk to you more about what this is so we are building here there is you know there is a vertical farm we are growing strawberry inside inside a warehouse here so these are the two but you see here back in that corner okay that is uh, one is an eggplant another is um cucumber and uh, tomato and lots of you know, what i'm trying to show you is you can grow Given. Okay. And that is the intention of this box. Inside this box, I can clone weather. I can clone climate. Okay. So it could be that winter outside snowing, okay, but we can grow food for plants. Okay. And uh, this is this is an example of the plant. This is a basil plant that I have grown in there and compare this with the plant that is grown in soil. This is the one grown in soil, exactly the same time I planted, okay? And here, this is the one that is grown inside the food computer. See the growth, how much it, it is better growth. So, and no, no soil. No soil there, okay? So this is from, from outside, I mean, better than do that. But you know, this, this is an example. What you're seeing here, the light is, is that this is the white light that I had. And the reason why you're seeing this is instead of, what are the two colors wavelength that chlorophyll use? The red and the blue one. 
So I took all the red and the blue and put it here. So I'm, I got rid of spectrum. Okay. So what happens is you're providing more of the good stuff that the the chlorophyll can use. Okay. That's why I affect. Okay. But that's not my interest. What I'm interested in doing this. I'm going to go and find out what are the different chemicals that each of these herbs, each of those herbs, see here, this herbs, it contains that compound. So these are the different relationships that I have. Okay, this is the herb. It, it has, it contains this compound. This compound belongs to this path. Okay, and this targets certain en enzymes. Okay. okay, and this enzyme is. It belongs to this this pathway. This enzyme catalyzes this reaction. This enzyme shows this bioactivity and so on and so forth. And this activity has pharmacological. So all the data that I have collected, okay, and put it in a database, I put it identify that particular compound that I'm interested. In, okay, when I go and look into this compound, the basal. For example, there are some compounds here. Each of these is, um, these are the number of functions are this one on the right, okay? And these are the compounds for each of them. So many functions associated with that. And that's the reason, go to every country, they have it for different use. Someone will say, oh, you got a cough, you take honey and lemon or something, right? It's the reason I want to go and find out why. Okay. Once I find out why, then what I want to do is I want to put it far such that it will produce more of that. Because you see that if you go and look into basil and you know ginger and so and so forth, there is one compound it is anti-inflammatory. Okay. There is another compound it could be antimicrobial. Now, if I'm interested in eating for microbial function, antimicrobial function, then I'd rather have more. Okay. So, that is what I'm How do you do that? And light, temperature, humidity, pH, these are what we call abiotic factors. We control that, and then the, the response by the plant. Okay, and that's the reason why you have. You know, you have, uh, we can grow orange in Nebraska, but it does not taste as good as what we get in, in Florida or in California. It's still orange. The reason for that is the chemistry. The chemistry behind that the environment is affecting what is produced. And that is what I want to control. Okay. And um, this is one example of but I have just finished, you know, the student doing the um, thesis work. Uh, this is Artemisia, okay? The, in Artemisia is, uh, we can extract compound to um, control um, malaria, okay? Here is the example. We treated with aluminum, magnesium, zinc, as you can see here, by treating with, uh, compared to control, look at the amount of Artemisia by aluminum. It does not matter whether it is week one, two, or three. The point being that I can control the production of this particular compound by exposing it to metal. Okay. I've also designed a box outside of it under the table. Okay. I have just the red, you know, red color, blue color, and we notice that you know I don't have the data for this, but we notice that the blue ones they're much longer compared to the red one. And the, we have found out that you know the blue it helps you produce chemicals that will help the internodal growth. Okay. So in other words what I'm saying is that we can do all kinds of stuff to, to achieve. Okay. This is this is the future tomorrow. I'm I'm sure that is not want to go to the farm. So they got people get older obviously you know not going to go and work in the farm, right? It's the young generation, they have to go and take care of that, and they're not interested in that anymore. Okay? So hopefully that's the best. <laughs>
maybe I'll leave it there and uh, ask any of you guys have any questions. So thank you very much, Professor, for the presentation. We can make applause for the professor. And now it's the time for our discussion and questions. So maybe somebody is already prepared. Please raise your hand and I will get the microphone. Still no, Prepar preparation is still on the process. Uh, okay, um, of course I do understand that uh, students from biology or informatics are more smart in the field. But at the same time, uh, during your presentation, they raised some questions for me. Uh, and if you could um, give some in more information about some issues. You mentioned your nice group uh, working in Nebraska University in the informatics field. And you mentioned some experiments uh, which are like mainstream in your department. I was wondering about those uh, experiments with mouses. You mentioned that the dean is working with the mouse and dependence of the decision and the age of the mouse. Do you do any uh, experiments with mouses and um, uh, results depending on the gender of, or sex of the mouses? Female, male mouses, does it uh, make any sense in your research? The different parameters, you know, that it's always used depending on what your research question is. Um, so most of the time in our department, we don't deal with living animals. It is collaboration with the folks at the medical center. So there is there is a, a faculty member in the, the medical school. I believe he is with the geriatrics department. So he was interested more in finding out what are the different uh, genetic functions for, you know, why do I lose my muscle tense? You know, things those are important for older age people, and he's using mouse as a model to understand those. And uh, that behavioral data in terms of, uh, you know, why ma mouse, you know, the older one, they, may, they plan their, their trip ahead of time compared to the younger one, I think that is definitely coming from the from from the collaborator, but what what the what the dean and his group did was for each of those mice, you know, the collaborator collects sample. You know, it could it is most probably it is the the hippocampal. It is a brain. We go and look into the brain and the function of that brain. Okay, and they do the 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 RNA-seq analysis or the transcript analysis. And now they want to say, okay, here are the different genes that is similar or different in the young A's and the old A's mice, okay? And they collaborate, they talk to the collaborator and try to associate these gene function with the behavior. So that's an overlap that they find. So as you can see that, you know, most of the biomedical informatics work is there is a data generator and there is a data analysis people, and we do most of the analysis. Thank you. Maybe somebody already prepared. Still not. Yeah. Uh, uh, and continuing with your, if it's possible to ask about the uh, food computer, you mentioned that uh, you noticed some, some differences between. Uh, originally planted uh, plants and those planted in the food computer. Um, are you planning some uh, to make some researches how they will influence our uh, human health or uh, genes, even in this case, um, or it's the ordinary plant and there is no difference between the influence of such a meal for human health? Is always a concern, but uh, here is my logic. The only difference between what I'm growing in the food computer and the same thing that is grown on in the in the soil 
is that in the so plant needs few chemicals, you know, potassium, nitrogen, some minerals, right? And basically carbon dioxide and water. That's what they need. Now, in the soil, it's the fungus or is the bacteria. They're basically digesting complex, you know, nitrogenous and other material and making it available for a plant to suck it through the root, right? And what I'm doing there is I'm I basically I'm identifying what are those chemicals that plant use, and then I'm providing them in a form of, you know, direct chemicals. Now, the effect of growth, you know, is it the, you know, it's accelerated. It's not deformed. Now, would it have any consequence? I have to go and find out. I have not done that yet. But I do not believe that there would be any, any new thing that I have added there, unlike the genetic modification, right? So genetic GMOs, it's very much um, against, people are against that. The whole industry is being doomed. It's mainly because you are introducing a new stuff, new thing, new gene, which is going to stay in nature forever, right? And you don't know what the consequence is. What is the effect of that being in a new environment, right? And so, yes, it has not been tested and maybe the consequence is bad. But in this case, you're not, you're not adding anything new. You're just providing more pure. <laughs> so you eat pure, you, you're healthy and you grow faster, right? That's the logic. So I think I'm, I'm comfortable in saying that I don't think I'm introducing anything new. So that the thing that you eat there would be healthy. But of course, everything needs to be proven. You know, unless it's proven, you can't. But given what I know, I think I'm comfortable at this time eating that. And I've eaten that. You know, my wife makes pesto all the time <laughs> at the base of there. So. Maybe we have a question from the audience. Do you have any question? Okay, so I'd like to ask, uh, the cancer is very global problem for humanity. So do you have any research regarding cancer? The yes, um, well, cancer, I think um, there is a growing consensus now that it's not a disease that can be cured, okay? It's a disease that will be managed. Just like you have a viral infection, you have a bacterial infection. Right? Um, I wouldn't say bacteria. Bacteria, you can kill it and then you can, they can get over it. But other diseases, just like you know diabetes and hypertension and this and that, it's a chronic disease. Now we have, you know, that mutation process. You know, during every time the cell is replicated, you could introduce error. It is part of development. It's part of normal development. Sometimes goes bad, or this new change is in an environment that is not suitable for normal growth. Okay, so it's a it's a part of the process. Now, in terms of management, how can you manage better? Is when you have more information, and now we have more information. You know, especially with TCGA data. Google is today, right, is because over the years they have learned a lot of stuff and that is again the weather 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 forecasting data. So as we learn and we have we collect more data relating to cancer, I maybe anybody from the audience would like to ask something. So maybe the last question, if you, you will have more, please ask Professor after the lecture. You mentioned about your PhD thesis and the experiment when you took the genome of human gene and mouse gene and put it in the carrot. 
also speak or something like that. Could you explain what you was expecting from this experiment and what kind of result did you get? Yes, so my my research career was more on doing plant tissue culture. As you know, there are a lot of people all around the world that are doing plant tissue culture and I think that particular technology is very famous in orchids. And in Thailand and many other countries, they do grow orchids using tissue culture. So um, there is a new, there is a concept a little different than human cell division. See, uh, in the case of human, you cannot take um, like skin or different parts of your cell and grow the entire you know, organ. You can't do that because you know, in, in the early stages of embryogenesis, we call, um, a, they differentiate into different types. Right, and the the, the 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 new development with stem cell that was novel because they are naive, meaning they have not been differentiated one way or other. So they are starting to use that for different purposes, right? But in the case of plant, you can take the leaf, you can take you know different parts of the plant, and then grow them into the entire plant. That is, you know, it's somatic um, cell giving you a new plant. It's basically cloning. Okay, you know, just like people do grafting, you know, they take one and graft it with, with the root stock. You know, it's very common with, with roses and other plant. But uh, in plant, what we do is we call somatic embryogenesis. So instead of going the getting the embryo from, from the seed, which is not somatic, it's from genetic, that's the traditional method where the father and mother contribute to that embryo. But in my in, in the lab at that time they were looking into something called somatic embryogenesis, meaning how can you make more of the same plant starting from tissue, whether leaf or different parts of the plant. And so that process is called somatic embryogenesis and that was a developmental question. So the research was what favors that somatic embryogenesis process? So my earlier, uh, you know, the lab mates or my my advisor had um, this theory that polymine metabolism. Um, there is a, you know, there is a uh, this polymine biosynthetic process, and there were key enzymes. You know, was ornithin decarboxylase and S-methionine decarboxylase, SAMDC and ODC. These were the two enzymes in that pathway which are responsible for making these polymines. Okay, so he, we, what we said, if we make more of that, then can you see more of somatic? And that is what we did. And I, I proved that, yeah, that was the case. I was able to demonstrate that more proteins, more of these um, enzymes were made there, and then that resulted in uh, affecting somatic. Professor, no questions from the audience. We are very satisfied about your presentation. And I will ask for, for Associated Professor Agidius to summarize our lecture. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. I think we now think we now more understand bioinformatics and uh, you see that it's real, very important science and research things because we can use it for various kinds, for diseases, to solve problems of humanity. So I'd like to wish luck to the professor to continue by mathematics, research, more research things, and come back and present me the new research. So thank you very much. Thank you for professor. Uh, it's uh, It was a big pleasure for us to listen to your research results. Thank you for accepting our um, invitation to be a part of Research as Excellence Network event. Thank you for everybody connecting via internet and sitting here in the audience and listening for, for this lecture. I would like to remind that on Thursday we, we had the last public lecture of Professor Rosh Pinterich, and he will talk about more social uh, 
important topic about the future of European integration, which is a very important topic in nowadays world when elections in, uh, in the context of Brexit, in the context of election in France and so on. So you are always uh, welcome to be the part of this event. So thank you once more for everybody and uh, hope to see you again on Thursday and other events of Research Excellence Network. Have a nice afternoon.